So welcome, uh, Professor Sorin Bayashu. And uh, you are in the UK, I am in Sweden. And we are here to have a conversation about the idea, the notion of philosophical health, which is by no means normative. Therefore, uh, I'm curious to understand and discover how you understanding from your uh, perspective and your experience. Uh, I know that, for example, you've worked a lot on Kant. Uh, Kant is a is a philosopher that I, I I'm not a specialist of, but I. I do recognize that with his ideas of um, sapere ode, dare to know, and also think for oneself, those ideas are very much uh, attuned to, to, to what we, we could call the, the, the core of philosophical health. But I'm sure you, you have a more qualified uh, understanding of, of this. Uh... Well, maybe a more qualified understanding of Kant, maybe slightly more. Um, but as far as philosophical counseling is concerned, I mean, I could see there are some approaches in philosophical counseling where Kant seems to be used a bit more than in others. Um, uh, there is, for instance, uh, a bit in uh, logic-based um, therapy uh, where some uh, philosophical counselors talk about uh, certain um, developing certain virtues of reasoning. And for instance, they sometimes give the example of uh, Kant uh, because Kant put so much emphasis on uh, human dignity and how one problem, one, one, if you want, vice of thinking sometimes for individuals is that they don't give themselves the credit. Any human being um, with the dignity a human being should have, uh, they don't give themselves enough credit um, that any human be being should give to himself or herself. So there, I there is the use of Kant in certain approaches. But um, um, uh, there is, I think, perhaps interesting, in a very interesting way, uh, there is a search in philosophical counseling. Um, at least some, some counselors are trying to find a, a framework and there are many approaches. Uh, and as far as I'm concerned, I'm happy with many approaches. But one way in which some philosophical counselors try to, um, um, they, 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 they don't simply want philosophical counseling or um, philosophical health to be about um, a, a, a discussion with a client or depending how one wants to call um, the, the person uh, the counselor talks to or with. Uh, some may want to call him client, some may want patient, or some may want to call, call them uh, co-discussant, but um, they don't just want a discussion which is um, um, carrying on with it with, without some normative content. And sometimes they are thinking of certain eth general ethical principles as providing this kind of uh, normative content. And when they talk about ethical principles, they make, may make reference to, to Kant. So there was at one point, for instance, I was talking to a, a philosophical, um, well, he, he's not a philosophical counseling, actually, he's a, a psychotherapist. So he's practicing psychotherapy. And he was very curious about this idea of uh, e ethical constraints. And he asked me, okay, but what, what can you see as an ethical constraint? Because people, some people think that this is right, other people think that this is wrong. And even if you give Kant as an example, is I but either too abstract or has certain assumptions which can be uh, uh, questionable. So my thought was that perhaps 
one thing that Kant does quite well is with his formula of humanity. I don't know whether there is anybody who can deny the fact that it's wrong to treat another human being merely as a means and not at the same time as an end. And I think that can be taken, I, I think it's intuitive. We shouldn't use the others, we shouldn't exploit them. There are various forms of using them. Um, we should take into account the fact that they have their own purposes, their own um, views. So I think that's useful. That's a useful aspect of, of Kant's philosophy, independently perhaps from his um, metaphysical um, theories and independently from, from all the other parts of his, his theory. This is an intuitive principle, which I think is difficult to, to reject or to debate. Mm -hmm. Um, it's very interesting if I may interrupt you here such that we have a conversation and there are people watching this view that, that might not be uh, specialists in the history of philosophy. Uh, you said two things that I found particularly interesting and I would like to connect. You talked about dignity, uh, credit that one attributes to oneself and which sounded a little bit like self-esteem and perhaps you're going to tell me what difference do you see? And then you talk about the um, considering the other as an end and not only as a means. And I think this is connected because in a way, this uh, dignity in the sense of self-esteem is about also considering oneself uh, as an end, right? And this is probably connected in the sense that people, and we must say that we all indulge in that, uh, vice, according to Kant, right? Like there are all, all moments that we all basically, uh, uh, as Sartre would put it, we, we don't see the person, we see the function, uh, the waiter, uh, etc. And um, and unless it's in Paris, it's if it's in Paris, it's the opposite. It's the, the waiter that sees you as an object <laughs> but uh, and insults you, etc. But so what... what um, relationship do you see uh, between since you're interested also in psychology between these concepts that are more psychological like self-esteem and uh, philosophical concepts like dignity why are why is there a difference why is there something as philosophical health uh, which would be different than psychological health I think there are, I mean, I think you're, you're absolutely right that um, the, this idea of self-esteem is quite close to um, the idea of uh, dignity um, or, and also the, the idea which I mentioned before, I, I provided a kind of interpretation of this idea of dignity as um, um, gi giving giving credit to yourself, at least uh, insofar as uh, you or I are human beings. So at least giving credit to ourselves as human beings, as moral beings, uh, and hence as morally equal to all the others. So I think there is clearly a, a, a link you're right between this idea of self-esteem. I cannot see I, I cannot see any other um, uh, ground for this idea of self-esteem than this idea that we are moral beings. And insofar as we are moral beings, we are equal to each other. Of course, we have different talents. And of course, we may use our talents differently. And that may create differences between us. And there are plenty of differences. But if we are to be considered as moral beings, we are all worthy of equal consideration. Um, now, um, so, so that's the link, and I think you are, you are right about this. Concerning the, um, the fact that some, some of the co concepts we use are also used in psychology, and what the connection is between um, psychology and philosophy, or more uh, generally philosophical counseling, um, I, I think, I mean, 
I'm familiar with debates. There, are, there is, for instance, uh, uh, one approach in philosophical counseling, um, it, which can be called uh, also psychotherapy, but it's not in the sense, traditional sense of a person doing psychotherapy, but it's in this sense that um, uh, some counselors think that philosophical counselors don't take the psychology of the human being sufficiently into account. And there are these views, for instance, that, well, what do we do when we philosophize? We use a lot of psychological processes. Um, they also say that philosophy doesn't happen out of um, uh, thin air, but it takes place in the context in which we have a brain, uh, we have thoughts, um, we have, there are certain uh, psychological laws that we follow, whether we want it or not. And they feel that sometimes philosophical counselors don't take into account this uh, aspect. And they want a bit more of a connection between philosophical counseling and uh, psychology. So I'm aware of this. My, my impression, nevertheless, without denying any of this and de without denying the fact that psychology can help a philosophical counselor, know, knowing more about the psychology of individuals can only help us. I still feel that there, there is a difference in method between what philosophers do and what psychologists do. And um, some of the concepts which are developed by psychologists are uh, empirical concepts. They are the result of studying human psychology, the result of sometimes testing. And our uh, the philosophical approach uh, is in many cases not, I mean, without wanting to deny the fact that there are many empirical concepts in philosophy as well, uh, we, used, we, we use them differently and we have different purposes. So that's, that's, that's how I see, I, I still see a difference between uh, the two. You mentioned Sartre, it's an interesting example because Sartre uses many uh, uh, psychological concepts, but he always says that he sees them as um, ontological. He uses them in an ontological way. So he may use shame, for instance, but he has a particular structure of the subject that he thinks um, uh, is in place uh, when uh, shame occurs. Um, and, and there are many such concepts that he's using but with, with, a, with a philosophical ontological, um, 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 from, from a philosophical ontological perspective. So I still see, see as a difference of methods. Now, I don't know, I mean, I would be curious to, to, to know what, what your view of the link between philosophical health and psychology is. Do mm -hmm. you have a, a, a view or a, a theory on this? Well, there is a historical um, difference that I think is important is that even if one were to create a strong bridge between philosophical health and psychological health, one would be um, hindered by the way psychology is done today. And, and that gives us an explanation also on what philosophical health too, because philosophical health for me, at a very simple level, level, is, and this is quite an existentialist idea, is the adequation between the way we think and what we do. So given the fact that psychologists today are, for a vast majority, engaged in a process of uh, petty fogging measuring of, of uh, very small, tiny aspects of reality devoid of social context very often in, in, in lab, et cetera. I'm a bit critical here, but uh, it has, I think it, it has lost is philosophical roots, which it had in the 19th century. And which to be fair, some psychologists today are claiming uh, we should go back to, and it's not only today, in, there is a parallel history of uh, psychology with, for example, in the 60s, uh, 
phenomenological, psychology, etc. So philosophy, I think, is the care for the whole. And there is a reluctance in philosophy that uh, that is about being very careful about reducing the world to numbers. Mm -hmm. And I think it's one of the very few disciplines which can still, and, and very riskfully so, because there's, I mean, the time where philosophers were respected, I think, is gone or where. We're. So doing philosophy is this very dangerous care for the whole that tries to say something significant without uh, reducing the world to to uh, data, measurable data. So which doesn't mean that we should indulge on the other, perhaps extreme, which would be pure speculation without empirical, um, you know, uh, uh, encounter. What I would think Hegel would call the negative. I think the negative is the real. And, and I mean, that's actually what Hegel says himself. So in my practice, for example, um, at the moment, I, I, I just finished conducting interviews with people living with spinal cord injury about uh, their uh, interpretation of life. But the way I conduct this, I have a methodology, which is six phases, which starts with the bodily sense, etc. I can enter into details if you wish. And, and that generates, a, yes, that generates some form of data, if you want to call it, the qualitative data that can be analyzed and compare. And words, in a way, are themselves a, a matrix that, that can be analyzed in a way that it's um, not only uh, poetical. So I think there is a, a difference de facto in the way that things are done today. Nevertheless, I could be equally critical of the way philosophy has abandoned the empirical field again for for 80 percent of it uh, and so there is i think and i'd like to know that this is my follow-up question is that you tell me more about your experience of philosophical counseling and why you're interested in it but i think there is a a, a domain that is has been abandoned both by mainstream philosophy or academic philosophy and by uh, academic psychology, and that domain is the the domain of the person. Basically, we could say in the very simple terms, the domain of the person and the domain of uh, sense making, and this is where philosophical health is meaningful, because. As the name indicates, it bridges the physical experience, the embodied experience, I say, in a more general sense, and, and the meaning-making experience. And this is not is something that cannot be reduced to, to logic and can neither uh, be reduced to, to behaviorism or neo-behaviorism. Mm -hmm. So there was a, a question in my answer, which is, how, I mean, you can, of course, uh, react and comment um, to what I just said, but I'm interested yeah. in how you, how you came about and being interested in philosophical counseling. Yeah, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm not practicing philosophical counseling. I'm teaching philosophical counseling and I'm teaching philosophical grounds of philosophical counseling. Um, well, I teach certain aspects of philosophical counseling too but because my training in counseling uh, ha hasn't yet started that's something I plan to do and only plan to do at the moment for the purpose of my teaching not for the purpose of practicing I might get to practice at some point but at the moment I find it that although the area is so interesting there is so little time to do this properly. So uh, for the moment, I'm, I'm, I'm moving bit by bit. So I started by teaching philosophical counseling to advanced our uh, third year students, just because I thought that this is an area that they should know about, they should be interested in. Um, 
but then I discovered little by little all sorts of interesting things. I mean, uh, it just seemed to me extraordinary to think a bit about what some philosophical counselors claim, uh, especially following the tradition of uh, Achenbach, uh, uh, namely that you can only do philosophy properly through philosophical counseling. And all those people who do academic philosophy don't really do philosophy proper. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that I thought was very interesting. Um, I thought that that can be presented as a challenge to many of the academic philosophers, especially those who take pride in being uh, at, at the top of the hierarchy, whatever hierarchy that might be because it might turn out that they are at the bottom of, of that hierarchy instead of being the best philosopher, they might be the worst philosopher. Mm -hmm. If you think that doing proper philosophy might involve something more, might involve something like, as you mentioned, a dialogue with a person, taking a person to be uh, uh, fully an individual who is not just a mind, but also a body, who is also part of a context, and we might not get in contact with persons in teaching. We get in contact with students, but our teaching is not focusing on specific problems. Our teaching is focusing on general um, problems of philosophy. So, so that, that's another, another interesting aspect, which simply... Uh, fascinated me and made me to continue to, to look at, at, at this uh, area. So, so I started with this, I started also with, with an interest, I mean, I, I did a lot of research on Kant and also did uh, research on Sartre, but my, my uh, favorite philosopher is actually Pyrrho, the ancient uh, Greek skeptic, radical skeptic. Uh, and they were doing philosophy differently. They were just doing philosophy as a way of life. They were interested in, uh, in, in trying to lead a good life. And we lost that. I, I think we lost that connection. Philosophy is not done today for that. Philosophy is done for many other reasons, but perhaps only towards the end also for this. I mean, it's been, of course, rediscovered with Pierre Adot and this tradition is being, and with, with, a, with a increasing interest in philosophical counseling as well. And there is more recently in philosophy an interest in the question of the meaning of life. Um, and people are looking at that from a, with, with philosophical tools. There are all these, but um, but perhaps, perhaps uh, that's that's the way to to re reconnect strongly with that tradition through philosophical counseling, and that's one thing that I'm I'm teaching, uh, and one thing that I'm pursuing in the in my my research as well. So, yeah. So that's basically what the starting point was. And um, di did you have a starting point yourself? Were you interested from the beginning in, in hmm. philosophical counseling or how did you? Right, yeah, no, and, and I'm going to answer. I just wanna say the fact mm. that you teach uh, philosophical counseling is itself a, an admirable singularity given our academic system. I, I actually avoided academia for many years um i was writing philosophical essays in paris where there's a tradition of uh getting published while not having a phd or or not writing philosophy in the um, academic way i was writing novels also and sort of avoiding academia because i felt that for many years i was not strong enough not to be um, uh, let's say hindered in my creativity by by the academic game mm -hmm. and uh, I did a training in, in uh, psychoanalysis uh, Lacanian psychoanalysis um, and I even wrote a book about it but I didn't feel either that I wanted to practice as a psychoanalyst because I think unfortunately it has become itself a a practice that is too normative and, and uh, too much um, uh, burdened by uh, 
a, a, um, a nomenclature that uh, is also what we see in other psychological fields. So it took me a long time. And actually, when I, so I, I eventually uh, felt old enough and perhaps strong enough, or had the illusion of being strong enough to uh, to do a PhD uh, at Edinburgh, actually, not uh, not far from where you were, uh, or where you were. And um, and then when I, uh, then I moved to Sweden for, for personal reasons, my daughter is here, et cetera. And I thought, well, now it's time, since you're going to to um, do research with the academic discourse uh, rules, etc., which which I I, I find interesting uh, at now uh, to to start counseling. And I I opened um, a counseling office in Stockholm in 2018. Uh, uh, it was a sort of a Trojan horse because I I opened it within a cognitive behavioral therapy institute, uh, and uh, and of course I'm a little bit critical of how uh, CBT is is used today and the mechanical view that they have sometimes of the human being. So, and I was very surprised to to see that people were coming mm -hmm. to see me. I mean. We were not queuing uh, in hundreds, but there was an interest, and I felt that I had that it worked. But my approach was very intuitive, um, and I would uh, have a dialogue that was very much um, in a in a creative flow, adapted to the person. Now I I have uh, a a more um, uh, I, I combine it with a more specific six-step methodology, where I uh, uh, I ask people about their bodily sense, and then their sense of self, then their uh, sense of belonging, then comes the uh, sense of the possible, and eventually the sense of purpose and the philosophical sense. And what I have discovered is that. People might be intimidated or confused if you if you attack the their problems or their concerns or their questions too philosophically. If you proceed by degrees, then you start with the bodily sense and you go through these steps at whatever rhythm is necessary. Um, then they are able to to bring about and articulate explicitly insights that they were not aware of, they're more philosophical about their worldview or their, uh, the, the way they um, justify their, their actions or, or ground them um, conceptually, morally, rationally, et cetera. So this is, and, and I was not aware of, the history then like you i entered a little bit in the history and the various schools and and um and i and i think that it it's it's very interesting that this phenomenon is appearing in the last 20 30 years one of the reasons for it i believe is this is what you said is that uh, academic philosophy which has its interest i'm not a i, I wouldn't say that uh, speculation is is uh, is necessarily a bad thing. There's a, a a beautiful creativity and poetry in it, but because academic philosophy has has abandoned that sense of care for the soul that you mentioned with with Pyro and and uh, and other uh, other uh, ancient schools, uh, that has because it's a need. Of, uh, it's a human need that has uh, gone somewhere else for good and for bad. And so it has gone, for example, in all sorts of self-help books that are now using philosophy um, uh, or, 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 you know, transpositions of philosophy, uh, sometimes uh, a bit, you know, in a simple way, et cetera, but that is performed uh, how it is because university is not uh, considering it, and then it has escaped also into um, uh, philosophical counseling, which can be um, 
I mean, I personally uh, uh, do it with um, individuals, but also with, uh, I work with the, uh, the corporation Vattenfall, who is uh, producing energy in Sweden. And um, with, so it performs a, a very simple function, if I should use the term function, but a, a hygiene of the mind, which people are in need of and which they sometimes get disappointed because they, for example, go to university, they subscribe for a course and they realize this course is not, is disconnected from my own concerns and, and my embodiment. The, the, and, and, um, and I think that's, I will finish here, but I think this idea of effectuations, this idea of we use what we have, what is my experience of the world? And from that we think, and then of course, it's important to, we're not negating the tra tradition. It's important to, to see that there are other philosophers who thought about this question. But the fact that academic philosophy too often, too, but I, I'm sure there's a lot of brilliant professors who do it, but too often does not start from our experience of the world. Then people try to, to address these questions elsewhere. And I, I think that's that's um, what philosophical counseling is is offering uh, in, in the best cases. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, I guess that's right. That's right. There is there is perhaps a lack I mean, I, I'm trying to think whether um, I mean, it's probably just not only one one aspect because I I'm not sure whether uh, academic philosophy has changed the way has changed more recently the way in which it's been uh, conceived and practiced. Um, I mean, we had the ancient philosophers who had the concern for the good life. And, but then modern philosophy, I don't think they were so much concerned about that. Um, you get more and more uh, philosophers who are doing sometimes armchair philosophy. They, they are not so much engaged with um, they, they, they reflect on their own ideas and construct philosophical theories rather than being so much concerned with the uh, concrete aspects or specific individuals or specific problems. So it's probably a combination because it seems that philosophy has been uh, done, uh, academic philosophy practiced in this way for a few hundred years. But it might be that we are at the stage where now more and more people uh, have the capacity to, or the ability to uh, raise philosophical questions, to think those philosophical questions, to raise questions about the good life and perhaps to, to try to find answers and perhaps, as you mentioned, they don't immediately find answers in the academic philosophy published. So then they try to, to see whether uh, um, they, 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 are, they are searching for, they don't find this if they go to a psychotherapist. They sometimes don't, don't find this if they try to look for answers um, in, uh, well, answers concerning the good life, I mean. Uh, of course, they will find some answers from the psychotherapist, from the psychoanalyst, but perhaps not the answers that the philosopher would provide. So, mm. yeah, there might be this space now, a combination of the way in which academic philosophy is done with the fact that there is more interest in um, by each individual is asking themselves, well, is this a good life? Could I do something that is better? And more and more are interested in that. It's perhaps a combination, access to, uh, access to resources, perhaps um, education, uh, which is uh, um, better than it used to be, at least in general, um, 
Um, so, so yeah, there is, I think you're right, there is the space for philosophical counseling. And um, um, yeah, and it's interesting because I, going back to, to something I mentioned before, there isn't a method, one unique method. Um, people you sometimes give the example of psycho, um, uh, psychoanalysis where you have Freud as the kind of big founding father. You don't have something like that in philosophical counseling. But I, I think it might not be bad. Or well, perhaps the, the founding father is, is, is very old, like Socrates and dead a long time. Yeah. Yeah. I want to hear more about uh, pyro uh, uh, and and radical skepticism because I know uh, I know it. There's a twist there, right? It's not skepticism is not what we um, usually think. But before that, I just want to mention that I believe that philosophical health is also about it's it's of course about the good life. But it's also about the good articulation of our thoughts. And I think this is very needed today because, I mean, we both have students. I have medical students. You have uh, philosophical students. I, I, and, and I realize that, uh, and that's the same with, with adults and people in pri in a private sector, is that the capacity to articulate uh, clearly and explicitly what is moving us uh, not only in the emotional sense but uh, in the in the existential sense what makes us do things etc that is quite underdeveloped in a time where we we have social media we have all this uh, technological tools but in fact even the AI specialists are saying our problem with AI is human is that humans are not good uh, at identifying their goals, uh, you know, on on from a really teleonomic perspective. So I think that what philosophical health performs to is that it helps people, uh, you know, uh, rationalize their behavior but not in a way that is normative, not in a way that's necessarily logical, but in a way that encapsulates, uh, I, I, you wrote a book about freedom and such, this freedom that is a, uh, a modern project, right? But which has not yet been realized at the level of the mind. It has been realized in a physical way, right? It's like Anna Aaron said, we we have domesticated freedom and now okay we can go to the supermarket we have freedom of choice for our body to 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 get fed and perhaps we go on youtube and and uh we see other videos than this one which is is a mistake and, and all these choices are not really uh, radical uh in in the sense that they express some form of systematic worldview, which of course might be an ideal. Perhaps we could say no one has a systematic worldview, but I believe that's the ideal of, of philosophy, right? I think that's one of the horizons of philosophy. What would it be if I could express a, a, a the, the truth of my experience and how I see the world in a harmonious matter a, a style that that uh, is um coherent mm -hmm. yes i think yes i think that that might be right it might be that there is there are more fundamental problems connected to the question of the good life but more fundamental than that which create a need for philosophical counseling, such as the ability to articulate in a, in a coherent plan, thoughts, uh, purposes. Um, these are important for, <laughs> fundamental for, for, for a person. 
I think they are also important for having a good life, but perhaps there are even more fundamental than that. Um, that's true. Um, and yes, and perhaps it's a matter of becoming uh, literate with our own thoughts, more literate with our own thoughts. And that's perhaps something that is missing, especially for generations who are sometimes find a better partner in the mobile phone rather than in the uh, company of another person. Um, um, because sometimes technology is answering to what we, to, to the input we provide, but it's answering in, in a way which is not stimulating all the capa mental capacities we need in order to provide the coherent, uh, coherent plan, a coherent view, in order to understand ourselves and the world coherently. Uh, I agree. Um, I mean, there is perhaps here a way to connect this, all this with uh, Piro, because you mentioned you, 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 you're interested in, in, in Piro, to hear more about Piro. I mean, it seems to me that uh, Pironian skeptic, yes, you're right, that uh, Pironian, one, one aspect which is very interesting with Pironian skepticism is that it, uh, and skepticism in general, is that it um, uh, provides some of the concepts for phenomenology, uh, which I found very interesting. Uh, I mean, what, what Piro, so, so Piro, skepticism is of course about, you know, questioning certain, you, you know, questioning the dogmatic uh, claims uh, of traditional philosophers. That was what Piro was about. Uh, uh, but then ultimately it's again about, well, what do we do once we question those? And he, they were quite successful, <laughs> quite, quite successful at, um, at um, uh, uh, doing this, this job of challenging the traditional philosophers. Um, um, but, uh, but, but then sometimes that seems to be scary. Okay, so if we question and challenge some of the most fundamental truths of, uh, on which we rely, what are we left with? And then the stories of Piro who would question whether there is a, a pit in front of him and then he would uh, fall there and uh, you know have an accident and had to have friends with him to save him from dogs because he was questioning whether the dog would bite or not. This makes uh, skepticism not very attractive. But at the same time, uh, uh, Piro was quite clear what he wanted. He said, well, uh, of course, we are not going to question these things. Um, uh, of course, we are not going to, to question what uh, communities of people who live uh, a, 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 a usual life take for granted. This is not what he wanted, but his, 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 his um, answer ultimately was to say, if you take a dogmatic claim, given that I can formulate the opposite of that claim and that both of them are equally strong, what I need to do is to suspend judgment. And this gives me, um, uh, is the no notion of ataraxia, is the notion of uh, unperturbedness, a calmness of mind um, that gives me uh, the attitude, which is a better attitude than that of the dogmatic who wants at, you know, no matter what to prove that they are right. Um, but that doesn't mean that we question everything as skeptics. Um, so, so that's one thing which I find interesting. The epohe, again, it's um, their notion. Um, but the other thing which I find interesting is that I think some philosophers take these questions very seriously. And that's interesting because it's stimulating. You, I, and I'm, I have here in mind academic philosophers. I'm an academic philosopher. Um, there are interesting questions they raise. And looking at the history of philosophy, it seems to me that hence my interest in Kant, uh, 
Kant is one of the philosopher, one of, one of the best philosophers in terms of being able to answer skeptical questions by taking them very seriously. There are ways to answer skeptical questions by not taking them seriously. By saying, well, we know that, we are not going to question this. Well, if you don't question it, how do you know whether you are right or not? Well, I think Kant is one of those few philosophers who take the skeptical questions very far and still manage to provide some answers. Not, not all of them are good, so many of them are questioned, and so on and so forth, but the, the success of Kantian philosophy today uh, is an indication that perhaps some of some things he got right, so um, and sense my interest. But of course, Kant is just one of the philosophers I'm interested in, as you know, and also interested mm. in Sartre and many other philosophers. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah, you, as you were talking about skepticism, I, I thought that the um, contemporary psyche is, I think, a um, very much a skeptic psyche, but without the equanimity, without the, uh, <laughs> right? And so That's true. Uh, you have a lot of um, people who, who are incapable of holding a philosophical stance about life. So on Monday, they might think something and on Tuesday, the opposite. And, and, um, and there's a fragmentation also of views that is probably due to the fact that we have a lot of information, right? It's a little bit like a philosopher who is too much informed of the, the history of philosophy. At one point, we gain a form of sympathy for views that are that may be uh, completely opposed. But the risk there is a i mean let, i would say that perhaps the the sphere of assertivity is abandoned to indeed to dogmatists whether they are political ones uh and so in this search of the good kind soul that that is a preoccupation of many of our contemporaries there is a risk of depoliticization or of becoming uh insipid or 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 losing a form of uh character which is always a risk right because of course then a character is always a choice also is like i i stand for this while i might be open in dialogue to other views um but i think that perhaps what philosophical health can bring is uh, both the capacity for people to, to be able to understand other views, to mentalize other views instead of getting emotional. And, and there's a lot of that today, right? But also to uh, not to renounce uh, the search for a, um, a, a vision of the world, the, the search for a, a stance, uh, because the, it is not necessarily opposed. So, so I think perhaps we could uh, conclude here by saying that uh, perhaps we could mix the skeptics with with the Egalians and and try to see what happens uh, <laughs> uh, of such um, extreme um, combination, but which might be interesting today. Yes, sounds sounds like a good uh, like. like 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 a good uh, suggestion yes to try and see see what happens yes. mm -hmm. definitely we could talk i mean I, I could certainly talk for much more time that the principle of this interviews is that they last more uh, uh, less than one hour uh, but we we can uh, start again is there anything you would like to conclude with um um yeah i i i I think um, uh, I think it's a good idea not to not to have it too long, as you said. And it would be a pleasure, of course, to to uh, to meet again and to to discuss um, um, anything to conclude with.
Well, um, no, I'm, I'm attracted by, by your suggestion of combining skepticism with Hegelians, yes. Uh, I, think, I think it's fruitful. Um, and by all means, uh, I agree with what you said about uh, dogmatism as being the risk. Uh, um, uh, it, of course, we want to be open to a plurality of views. The problem is that, um, if we are, um, if that plurality of views is not looked at carefully, and is not, uh, is it, it, just accepted as such, and perhaps enjoyed, but without uh, a, a proper examination, without trying to see well, is this view fitting with the other I like, because they might not. The risk is that we end up with uh, discrete thoughts which don't fit together. And that's a recipe for, um, first of all, um, uh, uh, extreme skepticism, which you mentioned, and then that makes room for dogmatism. I absolutely agree. Huge political problems and so on and so forth. So yes, perhaps we can finish with this thought that philosophical health and counseling has also a very important political dimension, uh, which may not be the, the direct one, but it mm. may have indirectly, uh, it can make a political contribution quite important. I couldn't agree more. And as you were talking, I was thinking about um, the, uh, the, the, the drawing of uh, Francisco Goya, the sleep of reason produces mm. monsters. Mm. And I think this is something that the world should meditate today we see a lot of examples of this, of course, and uh, and therefore philosophical health is not only not only I hope uh, a a a new comer in the long list of various therapies, but also a movement, uh, a, a political movement in the noble uh, sense of uh, you know doing something that I think philosophy is interested in since Plato, uh, answering the question, what would paradise on earth look like uh, such that it doesn't become hell on earth? So, well, thanks a lot. Thank and you. Um, I will stop the recording now, if that's okay. Mm -hmm.